But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go. For he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled With the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. All right. Unlikely converts all. Unlikely converts all. I want us to think about people who are not likely to become Christians, right? I have a little video clip. Uh, It's a trailer, just a two minutes, a trailer for a a, uh, 40-minute movie. And the movie is called, the movie is called Don't Waste Your Life Sentence. And it's about people who believe in Jesus in a prison, in a particular prison, John Piper, some of you know, was invited to come and, uh, uh, and lead a worship service at this prison. And there are testimonies of various inmates who have a life sentence. These are criminals, are hardened criminals, you might say, who trust in Christ and believe in him. If there are any unlikely converts, you might say it, was, it would be one of these guys, right? Unlikely converts. People who are not likely to trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior. There's a guy also named Lee Strobel, among many, many other people who set out to disprove the Bible, but eventually came to know the Lord in a powerful, powerful way. Uh, So there are intellectuals who come to know the Savior. Uh, Some of the most, some of the brightest people I know with graduate degrees from top universities, Harvard, you name it, all these are the places. All of them trusting and believing in Jesus, believing in God's word as the Bible. You might think because of their education that they were, they were unlikely converts, but they converted nonetheless. But then there are people who live exemplary lives. They are very, very good on the outside. And if that person were to come to you and say, do you think I would make it to heaven? You might want to say something like, if anybody's going to get to heaven, it's you. You are so generous. You are so kind. You are so patient. You you, you can list all of these attributes of a wonderful father, wonderful mother, wonderful student, wonderful this, wonderful that. Nobody lives like you. If anybody should make it into heaven, it's you. 
I want to say that person is probably the most unlikely person to make it into heaven. Why? Because a person who has a good reputation, who has a lot of good to show for his life, has a lot to lean on to encourage him to think that he doesn't need a Jesus to be in the presence of God. And conversion has to do with nothing else than to trust not in yourself, but in Jesus. In this regard, everybody is in the same boat. Whether you have a lot of education or whether you have zero education, whether you have a lot of good works or absolutely no good works, a good mother, a good father, bad father, bad mother, all of it, we are on even ground, everybody in need of Jesus Christ. That's what the gospel is, to trust in Christ and not on yourself, not on your deeds, not on your friends, not on anything else or anyone else, to trust in Jesus alone. On that level, we are all in the same playing field. The Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul, before he became Paul, his name was Saul. He's my namesake, right? I have a hard time living up to that name, the Apostle Paul. I like Peter because Peter makes a lot of mistakes. But uh, Paul, he's almost perfect. And uh, the wicked sin that he committed that maybe I'm supposed to be able to relate to is that he killed Christians. I, 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 <laughs> I haven't killed anybody, let alone Christians, you know. I haven't done that. But the Apostle Paul, if there was anybody who was not likely to be a believer, it was him. It was the Apostle Paul, because he was the opposite of a believer. He was the enemy of the church. In fact, he was so vehement against the church that he murdered the very, the very first martyr to give his life for Jesus. Stephen was murdered by Paul and his posse, Paul and his group of people who stoned Stephen. So Paul was, in a way, is an unlikely convert in that, first of all, he was an enemy of Jesus. All the time that he was attacking the church, he was thought he was doing God's service, or, or as all the while, he was actually attacking God, attacking the apple of his eye by attacking the church. He was a very unlikely convert. He was also, the Bible says, very full of himself. He had... <laughs> The best education from the best schools. He, had, he was from an influential family, from an influential town, from the, uh, with his citizenship. He had a, both a Roman citizenship and he was a Jewish, Jewish person. So he had everything else that he could possibly rely on besides God's grace. He was a very unlikely, unlikely convert. So we are looking at the story of this man's conversion to Jesus. Uh, an enemy of Jesus being converted, literally being knocked off his high horse to the ground by Jesus himself. Jesus appears to him in the middle of the day with blinding light, the Bible says, brighter than the sun. The Apostle Paul, he gives his testimony at least three times in the book of Acts. Three times we're told about this story of the Apostle Paul. So it's very, very important, very, very pivotal to the story of Acts. Now, we are heading through the book of Acts, by the way, segue here. Uh, not a segue here, a side, sidebar. I'm confused with those. Okay, sidebar here. We're heading, we're in a series right now, kind of moving through the book of Acts, looking at how God, how Jesus worked uh, in the early church and, and taking from their lessons and experiences and convictions that we could apply to our lives. And so right now we're looking at Paul, who becomes this hinge in the book of Acts, where in the book of Acts, all the focus was on Jerusalem and the Jewish people, starting now with the Apostle Paul's conversion God takes this Jew of the Jews and sends him to the Gentiles. And, and then from this point on, all the focus is now from the Jews to the Gentile world. From Peter, who is an apostle to the Jews, to Paul, who becomes this apostle to the Gentiles. At the end of the book of Acts, you see the apostle Paul, how do you say, in chains, in chains, but the gospel unchained being proclaimed from the center of that 
universe, which was Rome. Everybody who wanted to coming to the Apostle Paul's home and hearing the gospel clearly explained. That's how the book of Acts closes. It's continuing going out. That's why one of, the mystery, one of the ministries that I really respect is called Acts 29. Guess how many chapters there are in the book of Acts? 28. Thanks, Jeremy. I like your boldness, but you're wrong. No, okay. Anyway, but, uh, is, there's 28 chapters in the book of Acts. I love when I get to do that to Jeremy. But Anyway, uh, <laughs> I love you, man. All right, that's how I show it. Um, so 29 is the next chapter uh, in the book of Acts. This next chapter of what God's doing, that's the idea behind that ministry. It's a church planting ministry. The Apostle Paul is all about planting churches wherever he goes. But before he did that, he was Saul, and this is his conversion story. He gets blinded by Jesus. He gets knocked to the ground, and then he, gets, he can't see. Right? I just said that, right? By the blinding light, and then he falls to the ground, and then there's some kind of scales over his eyes where he can't see. If you look at Deuteronomy chapter 28, Deuteronomy chapter 28, it tells us that the curse for people who break God's promises is blindness. For people who are against God, the Bible says in Deuteronomy 28, they'll go around groping in the middle of the day. And that's exactly what happened to the Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul is being clearly proclaimed, clearly, clearly pronounced, clearly denounced as an enemy of God. The Apostle Paul, at this point, saw this Jewish teacher had to have understood that. That to be blind is to be cursed by God. And he saw that. He thought he was doing God's work. But he found out that he had been an enemy of God. Struck to the very core of his being. Not just being knocked to the ground. The Apostle Paul, at this point Saul, asks what he must do. He's told to go into Damascus. He goes into a person's home where he spends the next three days without eating, without drinking, in prayer. Probably those, in those three crucial days, he is rethinking everything in the light of Jesus, whom he just met. You know how in movies, all of a sudden, you're, you're, this is going on. And meanwhile, <laughs> there's another scene. So meanwhile, we go to another house of a guy named Ananias. And then Ananias is being told, has been told that this guy named Saul is waiting for him <laughs> at this other particular house. Ananias hears this message from God. And he is in desperation because he knows what this guy, is Saul, is coming to Damascus to do. All right. Before I move on to Ananias, let me finish with the conversion. Let me talk about the content of his calling. When God called the apostle Paul, then Saul, to become an evangelist, he calls him to two things. First, he calls him to go to the Gentiles. It is just like Jesus to say, take somebody who uh, is a Jew of the Jews and then turn him around and make him an apostle to the Gentiles. It, the going to the Gentiles must have been the last thing on his mind. It's not on any self-respecting Jews, um, Jews uh, agenda to be reaching out to non-Jews. But here it is. The Apostle Paul is given this commission. Also, he is called to suffer. To follow Jesus means to suffer. The Apostle Paul needed to understand that, that he would be a suffering evangelist, that wherever he went, he would suffer. As a Christian, you and I are meant to be uncomfortable in this world. If you are perfectly comfortable in this world, this world feels very much like your home, then there is some sort of disconnect between your Christianity and your life here. Because as a Christian, we are, we are told that this is not your home. You can enjoy the things of this world as gifts from God, but not as gods of your life. Only Jesus is God. Only Jesus is God, 
And these past few weeks, I've been saying things like this. What this is from, I think, other people. When good things become God things, they become bad things. You want to repeat that after me? When good things become God things, say it. When good things become God things, they become bad things. Say it. They become bad things. Okay? The bad things, the Apostle Paul, he says that all those things that he considered great in his life, all the education, all the reputation, all of those things, he considered all of that, all of that scubula. Say that. Scubula. Pig intestines. Pig guts. What every Jewish person is going to really, really detest. They don't like pigs, and they don't like their guts. Okay, he says, everything that got in the way of my relationship with Jesus, I considered dung or pig guts. So, repeat after me. When gifts become gods, they become guts. <laughs> they become pig guts. Okay, Gifts are meant to be enjoyed as gifts. Your wife is a precious gift to you, husband, from God. Your husband is a precious gift to you, wife from God. Your children are gifts from God, but they are not gods. They make wonderful gifts, terrible gods, right? And the apostle Paul uh, had to lay down his gods before, before the Lord, and it wasn't going to be comfortable. He was going to suffer. When you become a believer, you put a target on your back, and the enemy wants to make your life miserable. Somebody said, Satan now knows that he cannot take you to hell. So he wants to bring some hell to you. Expect it. Expect to have to fight on a battlefield. That's his calling on your life and mine as well as, especially for the Apostle Paul. Jesus revealed to him that he would suffer. And he reveals to you, loved ones, if you would live for him, everybody who would live a godly life, the Bible says, will suffer persecution. You will suffer. You will suffer struggle on the outside as well as on the inside. People you want to like you will not like you. Sometimes inside, you will have struggles with sin, which will be okay with everybody else. But you, you don't want to compromise. So you will fight with, fight with it. You will fight with yourself. You will do battle. The Bible calls it a war. Only Christians, only those of you who say you want to follow Christ, will have this battle, will have this struggle, and it's right. So keep in with the fight. Jesus knew that it would be this way. He called you anyway and prepared you for it. Okay? Things to understand from the Apostle Paul's call. Notice the absolute, so two, two things the Apostle Paul's call, called to the Gentiles and called to suffer. Called to the Gentiles, called to suffer. Also, look at the way that Jesus wins absolute victory. It is one thing to crush your enemy. It is one thing to kill him. But then, to turn him or her into your general? Are you kidding? Right? That's what Jesus did. He took, the, he took Saul, who was his persecutor, he took him and he turned him around and turned him into a general in his army. The greatest evangelist the world has ever known. That's just like him, isn't it? In Romans chapter 8, the Bible tells you, the Bible looks at Joshua and it says, you are more than a conqueror in Jesus Christ. You would say, well, maybe I'd settle with just defeating my enemy. No, Jesus says, don't settle for that. Love your enemies. Turn them into God lovers. Go far beyond just defeating your enemy. Bring them over into your side. Jesus is more than a conqueror and he calls you and me to be conquerors. Also, notice that Jesus takes persecution seriously and personally. When Jesus meets, this, meets Saul on the road, he doesn't say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting my church? He doesn't say, why are you persecuting my bride? Why are you attacking Tristan? Why are you attacking Aiden? Why are you attacking Gary? That's not what he says. Why are you persecuting me? When the enemy hates you, when the world get, goes against you, when the world attacks the church, the world is attacking the apple of God's eye. And God takes it personally. The Apostle Paul later in 1 Corinthians 3 says the same thing. He says, whoever attacks the church, the body of Christ, will not be, will not be um, held innocent. So God takes it seriously. Jesus takes it seriously. You are so loved by God 
that when you are under oppression, persecution, when you are uncomfortable in this world for his sake, Jesus takes it personally. Just before this scene, there is the scene of Stephen being killed. Do you remember that scene? One of the things that stick out from that scene, Stephen is being stoned. Stones are being hurled at his body. They're about to be, okay, just before the stones are hurled. They're picking up stones to throw at him. They're gnashing at, gnashing at him with their teeth. And Stephen looks into the sky. He sees heaven open. And he sees Jesus standing. Jesus standing to see him suffer for his sake. Isn't that good? Almost in every other scene of Jesus in heaven, what, you know what he's doing? He's sitting down. He's sit, sitting down to reign and to rule. But when he sees his Stephen being persecuted, stones about to be, about to dig into his flesh, and him about to give his life in a Jesus-like fashion, crying out for forgiveness for those who are persecuting him. Jesus stood. Isn't that good? And I want to say to you that it was an answer to Stephen's prayer that God would forgive the people that were killing him that Jesus transformed Saul's life. Saul was right there. Saul was right there when Stephen was being killed. The Bible says that he was holding the cloaks, the coats of the people who were throwing the stones. Why was it that, the, that Saul was able to hold the clothes while everybody else was throwing the stones? Because he was done throwing the stones. And he was available to hold the clothes so that everybody could get a full swing to throw the rocks at Stephen. So in a very real way, most likely Saul was the first one to throw the stone at Stephen. And in a very real sense, Saul was the one responsible for Stephen's death. It was this kind of person that Jesus called and conquered. This enemy that he conquered and transformed into a God lover instead of a hater. No wonder Ananias was reluctant when he was told to go to this guy named Saul, right? He says, Jesus, we heard about this guy. We heard how he persecuted the people in Jerusalem. We heard that he killed one of the seven deacons that we set up, Stephen, a person full of the Holy Spirit and full of wisdom. Yet Saul killed him, and you want me? To go to Saul? You know what else I heard, Jesus? Saul was being sent with the authority of the Jewish leaders to come and grab people just like me. <laughs> Imagine if you were Ananias. No wonder you would be hesitant to go to Saul. What if it was a trap? What if Saul was just faking it? Then Ananias could get arrested. Ananias could be beaten. Or Ananias could be killed just like Stephen, right? So he was hesitant, but he obeyed. There were all kinds of reasons that Paul was not a very likely candidate to believe. With all of his education, with all of his hatred toward Christianity, with all of his anger, with his traditionalism, this and that, Ananias had every reason to think that Saul would never truly believe. Yet Jesus said, no, no, he's a chosen vessel of mine. I've pegged him to be mine, and I want you to go get him. So Ananias obeys. He comes to the apostles Paul, then Saul. He introduces Jesus to him in a very real way. The scales that were covering his eyes fall to the ground, symbolically showing us that his spirit now has been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Whereas he was the object of God's wrath and curse, now he becomes the object of God's blessing and love. That's what happens here. The scales fall from his eyes, and Saul is now able to truly see. He sees Jesus for who he is, and the Bible says that he gets baptized. You know what, what kind of stuns me in a way? 
Why did God use Ananias? Why? After all, Jesus had already approached Saul on the road, knocked him to the ground, right? All the work was pretty much done. Why did he need to use Ananias? I don't think he needed Ananias. By the way, those of you who have beautiful voices, you want to sing for the glory of God? Do you think he really thinks your voice is so beautiful that he calls you to sing his praise? Is it because you are so talented, because you have the training that God uses you? No, it's because he loves you. If he wanted to, be used, he wanted to hear a beautiful voice, he could have used, now we know, Hugh Jackman. He could use Pavarotti, Placido Domingo, anybody but Justin Bieber. No, I'm kidding. kidding. All right. He could have used anybody, but he chooses to use you. Forget human beings. Hey, Gabriel, come over here. Sing me a tune. He could have done that. But instead of using other people, instead of using the angels, he chose to use Ananias. Wow. Let me ask you something. To whom is God calling you to be an Ananias today? This year, who will you reach for the glory of God with the gospel of Jesus? Who will you pray for? Who will you speak to? Who will you reach out to? To be an Ananias to him or to her. Even if I don't go, somebody else will go. Yes, if God wills that somebody else will go to that individual. But if God chooses you to be that person's friend, God chooses you to be that person's wife, to be that person's husband, to be that person's son or daughter, then why would you give that privilege to anybody else? Mothers and fathers, let me ask you this. Why would you give the privilege of introducing your son, your daughter to Jesus to a pastor? Parents come to me and say, Pastor Paul, would you please talk to my daughter, talk to my child. I want him or her to know Jesus. I am privileged to do it. I love to do it. Nothing brings my heart more joy than to hold somebody's hand and lead that person to Jesus. Of course. But why would you give me that privilege when God gives you that privilege first? You know, Stephen Curtis Chapman, his daughter died when she was, ah, what was it? Remember, I've talked about this before, eight or six. He has a song on an album uh, that that, that is um, kind of a tribute to his daughter who died so early. It's called February, I think, 20th is what it is. And that's the day he marks when he took her hand and she said, I want to go to heaven when I die. I want to trust Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Would you do that? Stephen Curtis Chapman, he asked his daughter. She said yes. And they prayed together. And from that day on, she knew the Lord. And then she died very soon after that. And he could not be more grateful for the assurance that God gave his heart, knowing full well that she would be called home soon. If God would give you the privilege to, of introducing somebody, your son or daughter, why would you give that privilege to somebody else? I've seen the whole gamut of, of letting the responsibility of your children off, to some, giving, giving it to, somebody, to the church, the whole gamut. Everything from parents who will lead their children in prayer, have family worship with them and listen to their hearts, to people who will drop off their kids in church so that they can go on a date. What? (laughs) What in the world? Right? The responsibility, young people, when you get older, the responsibility for your kids is going to be on your shoulder first before it is on on the church's shoulders or the pastor's shoulders. Remember this. Fathers, mothers, you are responsible to be Ananias to your children first and foremost before it is the responsibility of the church. Own it. Step into it. Recognize it as the privilege as it is. You be the one to pray. Let them see you praying. Let them see you loving the Lord. Let them hear you explaining him to them. One of the most beautiful scenes I saw growing up 
sneaking into the, the church when you were not supposed to. And I know you, you little kid, you guys, you know, you want to go places that you're told not to go. And so they told me not to go into the chapel when the service wasn't going on. But I snuck in anyway, climbing in through the vent in the ceiling. <laughs> but I found out somebody else was able to get in there besides me. It was a lady kneeling in front of one of these pews with her baby sleeping on the pew just like this, not knowing what in the world was going on. Her just pleading the grace of God for her child. For your children to grow up seeing you loving the Lord and learning his love by example, you being Ananias to them. The Apostle Paul, he remembered Ananias for the rest of his life. But I don't think Ananias was as much of a mentor to him as somebody like Barnabas or somebody else. Somebody said this, everybody needs a mentor like Barnabas, that was to the Apostle Paul. Everybody needs a partner like Silas was to Apostle Paul. Everybody needs a Timothy, a disciple like Timothy was, a son in the faith to the Apostle Paul. But I think also everybody needs an Ananias. Would you be an Ananias to somebody today? This year, you don't have to know everything. You just have to know Jesus. Would you ask him to use you, not your pastor, not somebody else, but use you to reach out to somebody for him? Would you ask him for that? I encourage you to step out in faith and watch him take you all the way. Watch him lead you to say things that you never thought was already even in there and draw things out of your heart in a powerful way. To whom is the Lord sending you? And who went to you? Who was your Ananias? Do you remember? Who was the one who introduced you to King Jesus? Those of you who believe in him. Second to my parents, I think there was a guy named Tom Maharis who was preaching. And when he preached, it was in a Baptist church. So they had uh, people come down the aisle. You, you know, when you, they ask you to raise a hand, I see that hand. And you, they ask you to, to trust in Jesus. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, Gina? You know? Because she, she, she went to the same school where with the same kind of thing happened there. And um, a lot of things that were kind of quirky with that. But Tom Harris got that right. And and he called, he called me, he called a bunch of people to come down the aisle. I went, I went in the back and I got the gospel explained to me. And uh, Jesus introduced himself to me on that day. I've never been the same ever since. Messed up a lot. But the Lord has been there. Amazing, amazing what God has done. Still very grateful for Tom Harris. I looked him up on the internet. He's still preaching. He's still serving. Praise God. He has no idea who I am. He probably doesn't even know if I exist. And that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. But I made it a point just to be able to tell you that I did, I, I, I did, to be thankful for him this week. Who are you thankful for, for having introduced you to Jesus? Will you pray this week and thank the Lord for him, for her? Maybe it was your parents. Maybe it was your pastor. One day I got a note on my, on my car. And uh, I kept it for years. And it said this, this girl, it wasn't coming to our church, wasn't in my ministry anymore. I left a note, though. It said, Paul, I praise God that you introduced me to Jesus. One of those times that you prayed for me, I think there were three. <laughs> I trusted in Jesus as my Lord and Savior, made all the difference in the world. Praise God for that. Such an encouragement to me. If you have access to your Ananias, would you go and thank him or her? Your mom, your dad? I know that it'll be an encouragement to him. So many go, people go their entire lives not knowing what kind of influence they've had on people to come. So be grateful for your Ananias. You be Ananias to somebody. My heart's prayer for you. And finally, I want, I want you to consider this, that there's no unlikely convert in fact, to put it another way, everybody is an unlikely convert. The Bible says that we were dead in trespasses and sins. We were dead being full of ourselves. How hard is it to make a dead man live? It's impossible. I don't care if the corpse is dirty or, or and bloody or whatever. 
Get that image in your mind. Or nice and cleaned up and stuffed in a suit. I don't care. You cannot make a dead man live. I don't care if it's a person who is rotting away in prison or is a person who is on the highest level of business class or first class airplane seat in a nice suit. Dead is dead. It's impossible. It is impossible for people to become believers, for anyone to believe. We praise God that he's a God who does the impossible. Can I get an amen? And he chooses to do the impossible Through you and to you. If you are not a child of God today, there was somebody the other day who was saying, at this point, I don't have a a problem with the claims of Jesus. I'm still scared to death of God. I think he's angry with me. You heard me talk about this. But I don't know if I can trust in Jesus. I don't know if he's for me. I don't know if I could truly believe in him. Unlikely converts everyone. Impossible situations, everyone. But when Jesus calls and you come by his grace, he does the unthinkable. He performs the impossible. Yes, this is kind of a radical kind of faith thing. But that's what God does. If he would do it for a person like Paul, if he would do it for people, other people who have persecuted the church and hated God, he would and he could do it for you today. As bowed eyes closed.